Disciple making, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse 19. Jesus says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Well, our church theme this year is Resolute, Following Jesus with Purpose. And so we're currently going through a series in which we're looking at seven foundations in a Christian's life. Uh, we've looked at um, assurance, baptism and public profession of faith, uh, church attendance, prayer, Bible study, giving, and today the last one is disciple making. And don't be fooled into thinking that these foundations are all things that you already know um, because you've been a Christian for so many years. You know, so just zone out because yeah, I already know that. And don't conclude that you can't learn anything <clears throat> from them. I encourage you to listen to each of the sermons in the series and ask God what it is that he wants to teach you. Ask God where you're slacking and ask him what he wants you to work on. Every one of us can learn, but we must have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand. Well, so far we have looked at the assurance in our salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord, and then we looked at the importance of baptism as our public profession of faith. We looked at the necessity of church attendance. We looked at the privilege of coming to God in prayer. We looked at the need for Bible study in the life of every Christian. And we looked at the joy of giving to the Lord, specifically through tithing. And today, we're looking at the last of these seven foundations in a Christian's life, disciple making. In fourth grade, I joined the school band, and I started to learn to, to play the flute. Uh, I remember how excited I was when I learned my first note, and then I learned my second note, and so on. Uh, and then I learned my first song, and I learned a second song, and, and, and so forth. And then I started practicing uh, with the whole, the whole band for a concert that we were going to have at the end of the year. And then the day came when we, we performed our concert, all the instruments playing together beautifully. All the hard work that we had done was worth it. And I share that illustration because I didn't just pick up a flute one day and immediately start playing perfectly, knowing everything there was to know about playing the flute. Uh, I needed to learn. <coughs> My music teacher, she taught me, first with a group of uh, other students, a small group of other students who were also learning the flute. And then, as we got better, we learned to play together with the rest of the band and lots of practice. And so my, my music teacher was making flute players, if you will, making flute players. And that was, a, that was part of the process of making a band. And for Christians, Jesus tells us to make disciples. And that's part of the process of bringing people to the kingdom of God. And we do that while we're here on this earth so that we can we can bring others who will then bring others, and so on. It's a process. So let's look this morning at what's involved in disciple-making. And to do so, we're going to see what Jesus commanded for us to do in the Great Commission. So first of all, we must go. With disciple-making, we must go. Matthew 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. I always enjoyed games we got to play in school when I was a kid. And one game, one game that we played uh, in classrooms was called Up, Down, Stop, Go. And, and we would do this to get some of our energy back after we'd been sitting for a while, you know, a long period of time. So in this game, you're supposed to do the opposite of what the teacher says. So when she says up, you're supposed to squat down. Anybody want to play this right now? <laughs> she says up, you're supposed to squat down. And when she says down, you're supposed to jump up. Uh, when she says stop, you're supposed to run around, and when she says no, you're supposed to immediately stop. Uh, it's a fun game because 
It challenges your brain when you're trying to do the opposite of what the teacher says. Uh, it gives kids a little bit of a physical exercise. And I don't think I was ever really good at the game, but it was fun. It made everybody smile, made us laugh. But I share that because when it comes to making disciples, we're not supposed to do the opposite of what Jesus says to do. When Jesus says go, he means go. Uh, when he says, uh, he doesn't say uh, stop. Go doesn't mean stop, not pause, not rest. Obviously, go means go. And making disciples as part of the Great Commission is not a game. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of Christians and churches in the world who are doing what the kids in this game do, the opposite of Jesus' command. Jesus said go, but they've stopped. They're not moving, and that's sad. Why, why do you think that happens sometimes with, with us, with churches, um, believers in the family of God? Why does that happen? Well, I think there's several reasons. We'll look at just a few. The first reason, I think, is laziness. I just don't have the energy to do that. Amen. Way too much work for me to do. In our flesh, we can justify this because we tell ourselves, I deserve a break. I've been working at my job all week, and I just don't have the mental energy to talk with this person about Jesus. And besides, you know, that's a pastor's job, or the evangelist. They can go do that. Now let me share a verse with you that tears those arguments apart. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians 6, verse 9 says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Now, I think that you would agree with me that telling people about Jesus is a good thing. Good thing being done for the kingdom of God. God gives us the energy to do this. And I'm not saying that we can't ever take a break, you know, so that we don't get burnt out. But I am saying that laziness is a poor excuse for us to keep quiet about our faith. <coughs> a second reason we don't go is because... We don't think we're smart enough. I don't know what to say. Where do I start? And that's sad because it's not true. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 26 mentions we have received the knowledge of truth. The knowledge of truth. And so every single one of us who came to Jesus in belief and have given our lives to him, we know exactly where we started with Jesus. Who is he? Many people have heard his name, but they don't know anything about him. Who is he? Well, you and I, we know who he is. We know why we came to him. So, tell them who he is. Tell them what he has done for you. Tell them your testimony. Will they ask questions? Uh, probably. Will you have the answers? Some of them yes, and maybe some of them no. Which is at the point when you can ask me as the pastor or a Christian who you know is mature in their faith, uh, who will help you with the answer. But the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ is not complicated. It's not confusing. It's so simple, a child can understand it and come to him. Uh, so don't use the excuse that you're not smart enough to go. Another reason we don't go is because we're afraid to. And this is sad because there's no reason for us to be afraid. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now, I know it's scary to think that someone might reject what we're telling them about Jesus. I know it's scary to think that they might make fun of us or not want to be friends with us anymore. I know it's scary to think you might freeze or you might not know what to say or you might say the wrong thing. Fear is a very real thing. But if we let fear control us and stop us from telling a person about Jesus, 
That's exactly what the enemy wants. Well, remember, as Christians, each of us has the Holy Spirit in our hearts, and he gives us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind, and he will give each of us the boldness and the exact words that are needed if we're obedient. <coughs> so those are three of the reasons we three of the reasons that we don't obey Jesus and go, but there are others that we won't look at today. But what I'd like to emphasize before we move on to our next point is that Jesus doesn't tell us to go on our own. See, he's with us the entire time. He's leading us and he's helping us, he's guiding us. Um, he's with us. So as we go, his presence is with us the entire time. He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. So we've seen disciple-making first means that we must go. And now second, disciple-making means we must teach. Teach. Uh, verse 19, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. When I lived in Machias, I thought I wanted to become an elementary school teacher. And so I started going to college for it, and I started volunteering at the local elementary school. Uh, my friend from church uh, was a principal there, and, um, and since, since I was doing it for no money, he offered to put me on their substitute teacher list at the, at the top of it. So I ended up spending a lot of time at that school. And as a substitute, I, I didn't have to come up with my own lesson plans. Um, which was nice, but I did get a little bit of teaching experience from it. And I discovered, I discovered quickly it wasn't easy at all. I had uh, two teachers over there who know what I'm talking about. One day, the, the teacher I helped out uh, most days uh, and was helping me learn, she gave me an opportunity to write my own lesson plan and teach my own lesson. And it had to be a main theme, so I decided I'd I teach them about, this was a fourth grade class. I thought I'll teach them about the history of lighthouses in, in Maine. I was so nervous. I was shaking when I did it. And I remember I bored those poor kids to death. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them were zoning out. One kid might have fallen asleep. And it must have been the worst lesson they'd ever had to sit through. I share that with you because I wanted to teach but I wasn't trained to teach. So I couldn't teach effectively. I needed someone to teach me how to teach. And if I had pursued a teaching career, that would have been a full four years of school. And I, and I probably would have become a, a better teacher, hopefully. Um, but anyways, I would have had to do the four years of school. And when it comes to disciple making, it's much the same way. A person who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for them immediately becomes a part of the family of God. But a person that gets saved can't immediately go out and start teaching others all about the deeper things of Christianity. And don't get me wrong, I am not saying that a person who is a new believer can't go out and tell other peoples about Jesus because all of us should be doing that. But they're not going to go out teaching other new Christians, you know, about the, 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 the Bible or teaching Sunday school or standing in front of the church and preaching. Not, not as a new Christian. They, they can't teach all the things Jesus commanded us to because they haven't learned all of it yet. And actually, none of us will ever stop learning uh, from, from God. And so, so none of us know it all. But what the Holy Spirit teaches us is all we need to know to be effective disciple, teach, uh, disciple makers. So that's what he says in uh, teaching all, all that he has taught us. Um, so the teaching Jesus mentions here is something that we call discipleship. It's the next part of disciple making because it takes a person from the beginning of their journey with Christ and it starts them moving forward and growing in their walk with him as they learn more about him. And we'll talk more about that in the next point, but for now, Let's keep looking at what it looks like to make disciples by teaching. Well, first, from looking at the Great Commission here, we teach them about baptizing. Uh, 
about baptism. It says, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll start by saying that it is important for you to tell a new follower of Jesus, baptism isn't saving you. Your belief in Jesus is what saves you. But baptism is our public profession of faith, which we've looked at in, in, in part of this series. It, it, it's a public profession of faith, so it shows the friends and family, the community that they've uh, committed their life to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 says, We are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All right, so looking at that verse, obviously we were not literally placed in the grave with Jesus, and then physically raised from the dead with him. So these verses are symbolic of what happened when we came to Jesus in our belief. The picture is of being identified with Jesus in his death, then being identified with him in his resurrection, and death to the power of sin, and Satan, and the power to live the new life that Jesus has called us to in imitation of him. So, with baptism, when we go down into the water, that is the picture of his death. And when we are brought up out of the water, that's the picture of, um, when we're brought up out of the water, that's the picture of, I'm sorry, just a second here. <laughs> when we go down into the water, that's the picture of his death. When we're brought up out of the water, it's the picture of his resurrection. And as we go down into the water, um, the picture of walking in newness of life is when we are brought up out of the water and the water flows down us and we start to walk out of the water. That's a picture of the newness of life in Christ. Um, yeah, I'll give you a bottle of water, please. Thank you. So I believe it's important for every Christian to be baptized as part of our growth in Christ. But if a person comes to Christ in belief and is never baptized, that person will still go to heaven when they die. I just think that they're missing out, thanks, missing out on a special experience. It's one that brings us closer to Christ, and it shows the world we're committed to him and that we love him. So, we teach them first about baptism, and then, um, second, about the Trinity. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Some people read that and think we are serving three different gods, but that's not the case. We serve one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're distinct persons with three distinct roles. But again, he is one God. And you're probably thinking, that's a lot to try to explain to a new Christian. And that's what's so wonderful about receiving the Holy Spirit when we become a Christian. God gives us peace to believe with faith that what he says is true. But also peace to know that we don't completely understand the Trinity, and we don't need to. Childlike faith believes it because he is God, and his word says it, and so we believe it. So a new Christian will believe it because of the peace God will give them. And why is it important to, to talk about the Trinity? Uh, well, there's false teachers in the world who teach that Jesus was not God. Just a created being. Others teach that there is no Trinity. There's only Jesus. Others teach Jesus was only a man. But without the Trinity, our faith falls apart. God the Father sent God the Son to die for the sin of the world. And God the Son sent the Holy Spirit to lead us and to teach us and to comfort us. And to indwell us so that we can follow him and we can serve him. 
all three persons equal in dignity, majesty, glory, and power. One God. So when you tell a new Christian, you know, about the Trinity, don't feel like you have to share some deep theological treatise with them. And if they have questions and you don't know the answer, feel free them to bring them to me and I'll do my best to answer them. But we want them to know who Jesus is, who the Lord our God is. Three in one. So we teach them first about baptism, second um, about the the Holy Spirit, and third, we teach them God's commands. What do I mean by that? Well, when we become a follower of Christ and the Holy Spirit enters our hearts, we immediately want to walk in obedience to Him. But in order for that to happen, we must know how He wants us to live. And that's where those of us who have been following Jesus for longer periods of time come in. As disciple makers, to bring a new Christian to the to the Bible and show them this is how we live for Jesus. For example, Romans 12, 1 to 2 tells us to live a holy life. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is your good and perfect, uh, which is the, the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now that's, a, that's a, a couple of verses there I think every Christian should memorize, because the way that we live our life now is an act of worship to God. And from there, we can then take them to other parts of Scripture, such as the, the fruits of the Spirit, to help them know what what growing in Christ looks like. Peace, love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. There are, other, there are other ways we can teach a new follower of Jesus, but we'll stop there. And before we move on to the next point, I want you to understand that you might not be a teacher or a preacher, and you might not have a bunch of Bible verses memorized, but that does not mean you can't teach someone what you have learned about God over the years. You know, it, God teaches us so many new things every single day. The experiences we go through, the trials and tribulations that he, he, he brings us through, and everything that he does, we are learning. And so when we bring someone to Christ, we can tell them, hey, Jesus has done this for me, and he can do the same for you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you, and he will speak through you. His word never returns void. Uh, lastly, we must grow together. With disciple making, we must grow together. Verse 20, <coughs> teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Sherry and I have been trying for four years now since we moved into our house to have a good garden in our yard. And we've struggled with it. But this year, a friend of mine gave us a raised bed garden and delivered loom with it so that uh, part of the garden was doing really well. The vegetables are growing together. They're planted in good soil. And we've had a few good salads uh, this year because of it. For Christians... When we first become followers of Jesus, we must find a church family to become a part of because we are meant to grow together, not alone. Jesus says here, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's a personal promise that he is with each of us forever, individually, as part of his family, belonging to him. But it's also a promise to the entire family of God. So, God is with the Bering Baptist Church family always, even to the end of the age. But a church body isn't made up of just one person. A church body is made up of several persons who are brought together as a family, as the family of God. And as we grow together, we grow together as a family. Imagine if we were all alone, with no one else walking with us on this Christian journey. 
would be awful lonely. It'd be really hard because we wouldn't have anyone to share our struggles with and to pray for one another. We wouldn't have the fellowship of a church family that truly cares about one another. We wouldn't have anyone to ask biblical advice from. We wouldn't have anyone to celebrate our victories with or to walk through our defeats together. These are all ways that we grow together. It's because we're brought together by God to serve him together. One day, we will be in heaven forever with all of the family of God. But until then, we come together as a church family to worship God together and grow. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 25 says, Not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 16, speaking of the church body, says, The whole body is joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now some people might say, can't that happen with any social club, like the Lions Club or the Masons or the Legion or something else? Yes, uh, people build friendships through those organizations and they're great organizations, but that's not the same as growing together as a church family with God in the midst with the goal of honoring him and glorifying him in all that we do. Another thing people might say is, well, why can't I have church on my own? You know, churches are, are full of hypocrites or some other excuse people use not to go. To that, I would respond by saying, well, that sounds awful lonely. But if we look at scripture, we can see that God intended us for, intended for us to join and grow together as church families, which, by the way, doesn't have to be in a building like this. You know, over in Africa, they, they meet uh, out in the, you know, the wilderness or the underground church in China, meeting, in, you know, in, in, in places that are not church buildings, but together as church families that God has brought together. Now, we can see God intended us for, for us to join and grow together as church families from Scripture. For example, the 12 disciples, they, they walked together with Jesus for his three-year ministry. They weren't on their own, and even when he sent them out to do ministry, he sent them out in two-man teams. Fast forward to the book of Acts. After Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven, the early church was formed, and then churches started to be formed all over the then-known world. It wasn't just one person here and another person there, isolated and alone. Now they were church families brought together to worship the Lord together and to grow together. Over the centuries, Christianity has spread, and now there are church families all over the world. So growing together is what all churches need to be doing. And that's what we're doing here at Barry Baptist Church, growing together as a family brought together by the Lord our God to do his work here where he has placed us. In closing, let's bring this all back to our theme for the year, to be resolute following Jesus with purpose. We need to be determined and unwavering in our efforts to go out in our community and bring people to Jesus. And when we bring them to Jesus, we must also ensure their growth in him by teaching them about Christ. Because we don't just want to have, you know, converts, numbers, whatever, somebody, oh, I got them to say the prayer, and now they're a Christian, and then just leave, leave them there, you know, to the wolves to devour, uh, you know, this, this world of sin. Um, anyways, we want, the, we want to teach them, teaching them about Christ. And then... Part of teaching them involves bringing them to our church so that they can grow together with our church family. And all of this is done with the purpose of bringing honor and glory to the Lord our God as
as we follow him together. Mary Baptist Church family, being resolute, following Jesus with purpose, here as family. Let us pray. We love you, Almighty God, and we thank you for your word. Thank you, God, for giving us the great commission and wanting us to make disciples. Lord God, of expanding your kingdom by bringing people to you and teaching them about you, growing together with you in our midst. Almighty God, help us as a church to be faithful to that, to go out in the community, to be shining the light, and, uh, and growing closer together as a church family as well. Committed to following you, committed to honoring you in the way that we do things, the way that we live our lives. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.